Well, good evening and welcome to this meeting of Columbia Road Baptist Church. I'm glad that you're here tonight, and it was good to have our choir back with us as we prepare for something for a mission conference and a desire to honor the Lord and to be a blessing to God's people, and so that was fun to be a part of it. Uh, if you are able to, I want to invite you to stand with me as we open our service in prayer tonight. Uh, I want to encourage you to pray for Pastor Steve. He's under the weather. I found that he was only able to be with us this morning by a copious amount of cold medicine. And so um, he's, he's resting up and we're praying for his quick uh, revivication because this is a big week. <laughs> this is a big week. And we're thrilled about all the preparation work that's gone into it, Pastor Steve, of course, included. So let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we come before you tonight grateful, grateful that we have such a good God, a God that we can worship with our whole heart, that there's no flaws in your character, that there's no error in your word. And Father, I pray that as we open your word tonight, that you would instruct us, guide us into truth by your spirit. I pray that as we sing your praises, the truth that's inside of these songs would be hidden in our hearts for a later date when we so desperately need it. Pray that you'd be glorified in the singing and that we would be helped by it. May we be different for being here tonight because your spirit has met with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing 241, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. The words will be up on the screens. If you want, grab that hymn. We'll sing out nice and loud. Think about the Lord as you sing. As Will comes to lead us. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there was the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. seated. This next hymn we're going to sing is not in our hymnals, but will be up on the screen. But before we sing that, I had something to read to you that I was reading today about the last song we just sang. Wonderful grace of Jesus combines doctrinal truth with a good melody and serves as a way to teach the doctrine of grace. It touches on the availability, sufficiency, and efficacy of the salvation offered by grace through faith in Christ. 
And it goes on to say that this song is a great way to reach believers and non-believers alike. Amen. Complete in thee. Complete in thee, no work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath part and bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed God, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath part and bought for me, and purified I too shall be. Thy voice shall be. Thy grace hath conquered reign within. Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed God, and sanctified salvation God. Thy blood hath part and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, each one supply, no, no good thing to me deny. Since thou my portion, Lord, will be, I ask no more. Complete in thee, they justify, O oh, blessed God, and sanctified salvation brought. Thy blood hath part and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be, at thy right hand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed God, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath part and bought for me and glorified, I too shall be. Number seven and your hymnals are up on the screen. Fill my cup, Lord. Only one verse and the chorus. Like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, Till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Brother Harold, would you please pray over the offering? Like the Father, we just thank you for filling our cup and making us whole. We thank you for your salvation. As we give these tithes and offerings, Father, we just ask that you honor them and multiply them to do your will. Grant your dwell the kingdom. Thank you for all we can be in your name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. Beautifully given. Beautifully given. Well, this evening, as we work our way into the next stage of Solomon's life, we have, unfortunately, uh, somewhat of a sad part of Solomon's life. You might ask yourself, with such an amazing beginning, with such a powerful charge that he was given, what an amazing start he was given by David, his father, everything assembled for him and put together the blessing of the Lord to build the temple. And then when Solomon was worshiping the Lord in such a lavish way and sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, God came to him and said, what is it that you want? And instead of asking for riches or the lives of Solomon's enemies or for long life himself, he said, I just want an understanding heart so I know how to do the things that need to be done in order to lead your people because your people are so precious and so great. And yet, he didn't end well. Despite the great beginning, he didn't end well. How does a man like Solomon, blessed with so many things, fall? Solomon knew God, he loved God, he served God, built the temple, but somewhere, something went wrong. In fact, it went so wrong that instead of the kingdom being passed down from the lineage of David, the kingdom was split. It was torn between the north and the south parts of the kingdom. God's blessing was withdrawn. And Solomon was blessed by God with peace, wisdom, wealth, and so he had everything that you imagine he could have needed, and even more that he wanted. So what went wrong, and what does it mean for you and I? What went wrong, and what does it mean for you and I? Well, I'd like you to turn, if you're not already there in your Bibles, to 1 Kings, if you would please, to 1 Kings. We're going to look together in 1 Kings chapter number 11, in 1 Kings 11, beginning in verse number 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. And it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it, for David thy father's sake. But I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe for thy son, for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Let us pray. Father, open your word, continue to guide us in it, add the blessing of understanding, illuminating by your spirit to your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So King David's son, King David has passed away by this time, and King David's son Solomon was chosen by the Lord in order to rule after him. Solomon had an amazing beginning with great wisdom and blessing. We talked about those things. And yet we know that the kingdom is split after Solomon's reign. And that afterwards, it's, it's touch and go in the southern kingdom if there's ever a good king. And in the northern kingdom, things just got bad, and they got bad, and they stayed bad until God brought them into judgment. And so in verse number one, it's pretty straightforward as to what happened. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Now, when you and I think about strange women, I don't know what comes into your mind. 
but I don't know if it's what the Bible is talking about here. If you're thinking about weird people, unusual people, people that maybe behave funny or look funny, that's not what we're talking about. You know, you've met people and you walk away afterwards and you say, boy, he's strange or she's strange. It means someone that does not or something that does not belong to you, foreign, from outside. And you say, well, what's, what's the big deal about it? Well, well, notice this. It says, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. So Solomon takes his primary wife from Pharaoh, who is the king of Egypt, his daughter. So as you can imagine, what gods did his primary wife, the daughter of Pharaoh, what gods did she grow up worshiping? Right? The, the Egyptian gods, as you would imagine. But he didn't just stop with one wife. He had many women, it says, and he loved many strange women. He was infatuated with them. So much so that he even took them out of the surrounding nations that God had commanded the children of Israel to drive out of the promised land. If you remember, the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. God delivered them through mighty, miraculous power, takes them through the wilderness wanderings, and under Joshua and his generation, they go into the promised land, and they are God's judgment against a wicked group of nations, warring tribes, people that had hundreds of years to repent and turn to God since God promised that land to the Israelites. They didn't. They continued to worship gods, horrible, vile gods with a little g. And so when the children of Israel came, they were not supposed to take them as their servants or take them as captives. They were not supposed to let them dwell within their coasts. But the children of Israel did not drive them all out as they were commanded to. And so now God told them, be very careful about these women. Look in, in verse number two, it says, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. You say, hold on a second. God says you're not allowed to marry anybody but an Israelite. These other nations, these other people that are around them, no, no inner group marriage, no inner racial or inner ethnic marriage. And, and you might say to yourself, well, that's, that's not appropriate in the day and age in which we live in. I want you to be very careful about noticing what scripture says. It wasn't so much about the color of their skin or the language that they spoke or the food that they ate or their cultures and customs. What was it that was the big problem? Their gods. Because every tribe, whether it was the Ammonites or the Edomites or the Zidonians or the Moabites, they all had their own gods, goddesses, and they worshiped them as a tribe, and they would bring them with you. And it was common that if somebody from the Zidonians perhaps married one of the uh, Moabites, that they'd end up worshiping both Baal and Chemish. And that would be a part of things that happened. And God was saying, you cannot bring them in, for they will turn your heart away from me. And if you think that's not a good enough reason to forbid the marriage, let me ask you, what is the very worst thing that can happen to a person? What is the very worst thing that can happen to a person? That's correct. They can die and go to hell. How does that happen? Because they never, by faith, trust God for salvation. Whether it's in the Old Testament, looking forward to the promised Messiah and the price that he would pay, or as we know now, the Lord Jesus Christ, that Messiah, paying for our sins and us looking back to the cross, salvation has always been by faith. The object of that faith has always been God. And it's always been the sacrifice of the Savior, that brings us salvation. So the very worst thing that could happen to you is to be turned away from God and that either in this life, though you know God, your life is miserable and without the blessing of God because you've turned away from him, or even worse, in eternity, you're in a place of torment. So there's nothing worse that can happen than somebody not having a saving relationship with God. And so that's why he makes such a big deal about that here. It says in the very beginning, Solomon loved many strange women. I want you to know that many godly men and many godly women have been destroyed by lust, by infatuation, by fornication, by adultery, by anything outside of God's pattern for marriage and for the, the physical intimacy part of our life. Many people have been destroyed for it. I'm not going to go into any specifics because I don't think it needs to. People might come to your mind, though. There have been many a mighty man of God 
or perhaps a, a family that you looked up to or a woman that you looked up to and they're, they're no longer serving God and things have been destroyed and their testimony has been ruined and it's because they stepped out of God's prescribed way that people ought to live when it comes to physical intimacy and marriage. We see that Solomon most certainly stepped outside of it. And so it says that they'll turn your heart away from God and most assuredly it happened because it says Solomon clave unto these in love. Can I tell you a sad story? Sad story of somebody that I know was brought up in a church that believed like our church believes. And though she, she was raised in a church like our church believes and in a good youth group and had a good pastor and all of these things, she ended up away from God and doesn't even know what, what she believes at this point. And you say, how did that happen? She gave her heart to the wrong person. She gave her heart to the wrong person. Somebody who did not have the same beliefs that she did, did not have the same faith in Christ that she did. And when confronted about that, I was told that her response is, well, our love doesn't need God for it to be good. And you see what, what happens afterwards. Something dangerous has happened because she claved to who she shouldn't have claved to, and it pulled her away. Verse number three, how bad did this get? How bad did this get? Look in verse number three. And he had 700 wives. They were the princesses, 700. They had the official status of wife, and they were all princesses and had that royal position. And it also says, and 300 concubines. You know what a concubine is? It's a, an official mistress. It's an official mistress, somebody who has been given a, a position in the household, but less to that of the wife, and usually only has one purpose, and the children that come from that line are not to be thought of as in the royal line, like the, the children of the wives would be. That is, how many, how many women is that? Can anybody tell me? A thousand. Do you know, if you average his life from 18, let's say, up to where about 60-ish, where he, he passed away, and if you average everything out, this means that Solomon brought a, on average, we don't know exactly when, on average, he brought a new woman into his harem, into his household, every two weeks. Think about that. That's the kind of unrestrained lust you say, well, maybe he really loved all of these women. Well, they had a very short courting relationship about every two weeks, right? Th this, this sounds almost like they're disposable, and he would move from one to the next to the next to the next. And his wives, it says in verse 3, they sure did turn his heart away. Away from what? Away from God. Verse number 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, for his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Notice that in the very beginning, Solomon was absolutely sure about who God was, about how there should be no other gods other than the Lord God. He was very solid about that. And you know what happened? He didn't end up in idolatry because he went from loving God to all of a sudden loving Ashtaroth and Chemish and Molech. That's not what happened. There was something in between. He added a wife in, the wife who was the daughter of Pharaoh. And then he added wife number two. We don't know who she is. And then wife number three, and then wife number four, and then wife number five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16, 17, concubine, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, concubine, 25, 26. And it just kept on going. And little by little, as they brought in their gods and their customs, as he became greater and greater in his own mind, as he had all of the riches and all of the wealth and all of the peace that was, his kingdom was known for, he was pulled further and further away. You see, it didn't just start one day, I love God, and the next day, I'm worshiping an idol. There was something that happened in between, and it was this besetting sin of Solomon that turned his heart. You know, it wasn't like this, where one day he's following God, and all of a sudden, there was an abrupt change, and he went this way. It was more slight. It was more like... More like a slow change. More like a meandering. Because it said when he was old, his heart was turned away. 
And sure enough, it says it is heart because lust is a problem of the heart. Lust is a problem of the heart. I want you to know that not everything your heart tells you is good. Not everything, despite what children's cartoons may tell you, despite what movies may say, despite what Hollywood may say, do not follow your heart. Do not follow your heart because your heart is desperately wicked. There are times when your heart is so unbelievably wrong that if you were to follow it, it would lead you to destruction. And not every desire that comes out of your heart, even those that come to you naturally, are something that you ought to indulge in. There, there's a whole branch of perversion today where people say, I have this natural desire, I was born like this, and because I was born like this, it's okay. Well, Solomon was born wanting a thousand women. Is that suddenly okay? Gentlemen, if you were to go to your wife and say, this is, this is my concubine, I'm sorry, honey, but I was born wanting this, so there's nothing to be done. How many of you think that's going to go over well? Well, this is what my heart says. Wrong. Your heart is wrong. There's a heart problem. And there are many things that can be done to address situations with lust and infatuation and perversions and, and where your mind goes off. Many things can be done. You can put filters on and you can have accountability partners, but it comes down to a problem of the heart. And if you don't address it in the heart, you'll never have victory over it. There's something much deeper than just, oh, circumstance led me into this. No, there was something wrong in his heart. And you know, what a, what a picture it says here. What a picture of a, of a worldly Christian it says that his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord. He was partially with the Lord and partially with these other gods. It's, it's very much how a, a worldly Christian is because their heart is partially with the things of God. And on Sunday, they're okay with worshiping at the, uh, the feet of Jesus. But then on Monday and from that time on, it's right back out to the idols of the world. And they're not out there worshiping Chemish. I'm not worried about you building an altar to Baal or to Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians in your backyard, right? I'm not worried about that. What I am worried is whenever we look to anything for life and satisfaction and joy and protection and comfort and wisdom and guidance, when we look to anything other than God for the things that only God should supply, it becomes an idol. If we give our hearts completely to anything other than God, it becomes an idol. It steps into God's place. And it's amazing how we Americans, we don't, we don't have idols, perhaps, like they do in other countries. And I've been to other countries, and, and, and I, I had to ask a few times when we were in India, I'm like, is this just a decoration, or is this a god? Can I buy this as a souvenir, or, or, is, or is this dangerous, right? They have those kind of gods. Here, our gods are money, material possessions, the approval of others, fame, comfort, pleasure, just numb it so I can get it through. Drugs, alcohol. Th these are the gods that have taken over our land. And people worship them, perhaps not at an altar, but in a, in a bar or in a club or in places that they ought not find themselves and they do find themselves with company they ought not keep with. In verse number five, for Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Baal, who, who we've all heard about, was the, the main god of the Zidonians, but his female counterpart who is known for the most licentious, horribly vile, immoral, physically immoral rites of worship. That's, that's who Ashtaroth is. Connected with the fertility goddess of Ishtar. Ashtaroth is connected and over time it was blended. There, there are horrible things that went on in the name of this goddess. And terrible rites were performed. Vile actions that were performed that won't even be talked about because of the company that we have here tonight. That was one of the goddesses that he went after. Why? Because one of his wives worshipped Ashtaroth. Probably many of his wives did. And so he went after her. It says, not only that, but after Milcom, which is another word for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. The abomination of the Ammonites. The monster, the filth, the vile, disgusting creation of the Ammonites is Molech. And you say, why was Molech so bad? Well, a lot of the worship of Molech involved human sacrifice, involved child sacrifice. 
in which they would kill the victim, human, and then burn them, or take the babies alive and burn them. This is the kind of horrible stuff that was going on, and you can't imagine how he could go from trusting the Lord God to engaged in this kind of sin if you leave out the part of the wives who turned his heart away. You say, is it all about the women? No, it's about giving in to his undis- unrestrained desires and not guarding his heart. It could have been another sin, but this happened to be the one that Solomon was weakest against. It says in verse number six, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. By the way, the Lord gets to decide what's evil and what's not. The Lord gets to decide what's evil and what's not. Mankind, when they're involved, men, women, boys, and girls, when they're involved in rebellion and in sin, we have an easy time of rationalizing how it's not that bad. It's not as bad as this, and it's really not that, and I only thought about it, and I never touched it, and I never inhaled, and it was only one drink, and it was only this, and and she and I are friends, and it's harmless. Don't worry about him. And they have all of this rationalization. You know what? God decides what's evil, not me, not you, not whatever I'm feeling at the moment. God decides what's true and false, what's right and wrong, and what ought to be done and ought not to be done. And we know what that is, not from some dream or how we feel that day, but because of what the Word of God tells us. And so Solomon's behavior was called evil. It wasn't just a mistake. It wasn't a bad habit. It wasn't because of his father or his mother. He couldn't blame anybody else. His actions were evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as David, his father. Again, this idea that he didn't totally abandon God, but his heart was turned. And so perhaps he'll offer sacrifices in the temple that he built, but then he also will go to the high places that were built for these other gods. And so a a little bit of this, a little bit of church, a little bit of Bible, maybe a little bit of prayer, a little bit of Christian music, and then over here, a little bit of running around with people I ought not be with. A little bit of drugs, a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of sleeping around, a little bit of fighting, a little bit of hatred, a little bit of greed, a little bit of cheating at work, a little bit of cheating at school, a little bit of this and a little bit of this and think I'm fine, because as long as they see me show up to temple on Sunday, or on Saturday in this case, they'll think that I'm fine. A respectable idolater. That's what Solomon was going for. I don't know if perhaps he looked around the world, and he saw what other worldly kings were like, and he thought, well, I can be that too. Look how great I am. But whatever it was, it was not wholly following after God as his father did. Verse number seven, then did Solomon build a high place for Chemish, that's, that's the god of Moab, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So right outside Jerusalem, right there where, where you can see it from God's temple, there's a high place where an altar is built where they murdered children, offering them in sacrifice. You say, how did we ever get here? Slightly, over time, hearts turned away, unrestrained desire, never putting any boundaries down, doing whatever he wanted, and that's where he found himself. Verse number eight, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. You get a high place, and you get a high place, and you get a high place, and you get a high praise place. It's like the Oprah Winfrey show of paganism. Everybody that was in his household got some kind of altar at which they could worship their false god. And so he filled the Bible land, the land of Israel, God's city, the surrounding area around it. He filled it with idolatry, pagan worship of the most vile kind. Well, what did God do? Verse number nine. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Does that surprise you that God gets angry? Anybody shocked that God gets angry? If you think for a second that God just loves everybody and and has no problems with whatever we do and he's just, you know, grandpa sitting on the porch up in heaven in his rocking chair drinking sweet tea, just hoping everybody stops by once in a while, the kids come to say hello, send him a little Christmas card. That is not who God is. You have fundamentally misunderstood. God is angry at my sin. And God is angry at your sin. He is a holy God, and he cannot look upon it. He doesn't sweep our sin under the rug. When he forgives us, it's not because it wasn't that bad. It was that bad. 
And it's not because it didn't happen or it wasn't an offense to him. It did happen, and it was an offense to him. The way that God can forgive you and I is because the Lord Jesus Christ paid for that sin. Someone might say, oh, I know that I like you a whole lot, and I know that you did wrong, so I'm just going to pretend that it didn't happen. God could not be just and do that, and he is a just God. And so it had to be paid for. The punishment had to be paid. And we deserved the penalty. We deserved hell and the second death. The blackness of darkness forever. Burning where the worm dieth not. That, that's what we deserved. And yet God wanted us to be with him in heaven. Went to great lengths. Sent his own son to step into our place. To die for us and as us. And that's how God could forgive us. Because it had been paid for in the blood of his own dear precious son. So when it says that God is angry here with Solomon, don't be thrown off by that. He's right to be angry. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. You might think that if God appeared unto you, it would do something for your faith. How many of you think your faith would be helped if God appeared unto you? I sort of feel like it would. I sort of feel, that's not a trick question. You're like, do I raise my hand? Do I not raise my hand? I feel like if he appeared to me in a vision or in a dream like he did to Solomon, whether it was about the, uh, the dedication of the temple or whether it was about what he wanted from God when God offered him a blessing after the thousand animals were sacrificed, you say, he saw, had this encounter with God, and yet still those, those encounters, I guess, must have faded from his mind. For whatever reason, he still turned, even though God had appeared to him twice. Verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. There's no way for Solomon to say he didn't know any better. I didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do. No, he had no room for that. God was very clear that he wasn't supposed to go after other gods, that he wasn't supposed to do those things. God had commanded it and made it clear to him. Verse 11, wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Here's what he says. You didn't keep the promise that you made. You said that you'd walk in my ways, that you would walk after me as David walked after me, that you would keep your heart right. And I want you to know, God wasn't asking anything unreasonable because even David messed up. And yet God still refers to him again and again as a man after his own heart and said that he had fully followed after him. Part of following after God is repenting of your sin when you realize that you've sinned, when God convicts you of it, and then re reapplying yourself to following after him all the more. Read Psalm 51. That's David's return to God. So David had his own problem when it came to somebody that he ought not to have been with, with a strange woman. But instead of allowing himself to run wild, he repented of that when convicted of it. He repented of it. But Solomon did not. And now he would lose the kingdom. This would come into the time when there would be the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom of, of Judah. Right? You've probably heard those things referred to. You say, how did the kingdom split? This is how it split. It split because Solomon did not walk in the ways of God as he promised that he would. And so he does not get what God had promised him. He says in verse 12, Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it, for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. You know what he says? The consequences of your sin are not going to fall on you when you're on king, but they are when you're on the throne, but they are going to fall on your son. God forbid, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, that our sins and the consequences of our sins, let me say it like that, the earthly consequences of our sins, God forbid that they should fall on our children because of our inconstancy, because of our unwillingness to do right and to say no and to put up boundaries and to yield ourselves to the Lord and to repent when we're wrong. God forbid that should happen. Perhaps you are a, a, a change in your family tree. I don't know all of your parents or your grandparents and what things were like. Maybe your home was a wicked place, a vile place, a place of abuse, a scary thing. And yet God saved you and, and changed you. And, and now your whole family tree from this on can, can be different. But it doesn't take much but a one generation to poison the next generation. You know how people learn to hold grudges? Because dad always held grudges. 
You know how people learn to, to belittle their wife or their husband? Because mom belittled dad or dad belittled mom. You know how they learn that it's okay to hit a child in anger? Unrestrained anger? Because it was done to them. These are, are the consequences passed on of not dealing with the sin in the right way that it ought to be dealt with. Praise God, we don't have to be held by our past. God is more than able to change our hearts and to change our homes and to redeem anything that's broken. You know how, by the way, that people become bitter and unforgiving? Because they grew up in a place that was bitter and unforgiving. You know how people grow up and they're never satisfied with anything and all that they find is what's wrong with people, with their children, with their grandchildren? It's because their parents pass that on to them and were never satisfied with them. These, these things, and I want you to know, I will not answer to God for the sins of my father. You will not answer to God for the sins of your father or the sins of your mother. Good news, if you know Christ as Savior, you won't even answer for your own sins because the Lord Jesus answered for your sins. But the earthly consequences can be passed down generationally. And that's what's going to happen to Solomon's son. What a terrible thing it is. I would much rather face it myself than to see it passed down onto my children. Let it come in my day than in the day of a little one who did nothing wrong. He says, how be it? I will not rend away all the kingdom, verse 13, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Not all 12 tribes are going to leave Solomon's family line, which is David's line. There, there's going to be two tribes. We'll keep two tribes there, and the other 10 are going to go on their own. They're going to go away. They'll eventually organize themselves, and they'll become their own northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. That, that is going to happen. But because of David's sake, and because that God has chosen to put his name in Jerusalem, there would still be two tribes left faithful to that Davidic line. So, what in the world do we take away from something like this? You say, well, pastor, I'm not going to have 700 wives. You've convinced me. It's nothing but trouble. No concubines. I understand it's nothing but trouble. And good, I'm glad you got that, but I think we can get a little more specific to where you and I are at. First of all, search out your blind spots. Search out your blind spots. You know what got me was how obvious... The problem with Solomon was because it was written that Solomon loved many strange women. And then we read that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And I look at that and I say, no wonder, Solomon, that you wound up all messed up. No wonder that you wound up with your heart turned away from God. No wonder. It's obvious, you dummy. What were you doing? But you know to whom it was not obvious? Solomon. Because I'm sure he didn't decide, well, I better start, if I want to make that thousand woman mark, I better start. What am I going to need? Every two weeks, I better find somebody. No, I'm sure that he thought it was expedient politically to align his kingdom with Egypt, which was another major kingdom, and to take that daughter. Maybe she was beautiful. I don't know. We're not told. He does make her her own palace, her own house to live in. And then he's like, you know what? I saw somebody else, and she's, she's pretty amazing. She's impressive, too. And no, she's, she's not an Israelite woman, but she is, she is formidable. And you know what? I'll make her a princess. I'll make her a wife. And you know what? I don't think that she's wife material, but she could join the harem. No problem. And one by one by one by one by one by one, it happened. And before you know it, he's sitting there saying, well, built another altar on the high place to Molech. I want his blessing too, I guess. That's, that's how that happened. And so he had a blind spot. He didn't realize that he had a great weakness. Now, I believe in the concept of besetting sins. I don't know if you believe in that, but I do believe in that. From my own life, from the Bible characters that I've studied in their lives, from people that I've seen, there, there's some things that are like a weak spot, a blind spot, and you don't realize how dangerous it is. For some people, it, it may not be the same as other people. And I don't think that we all have to go around and raise our hand and say what we might be. But for some people, it will be uncontrolled anger. For other people, it will be bitterness. For some people, they'll be like Solomon and it'll be lust. For other people, it'll be fighting. They're just, con they're just a conflict all the time. For some people, it's greed or selfishness. 
might be gambling, might be alcohol, might, might, might be any number of things, right? But it seems like that's the spot that you're always battling, right? Um, I personally am not, am not tempted by gambling. I'm not going to ask if anybody has trouble with gambling. I'm personally not tempted with alcohol or with substance abuse, right? That, that's, that's not something. But there are things that I do struggle against, and I have to ask God to give me victory over them. You may have trouble with things that I don't have trouble with. We know what Solomon's problem was. We can see what Moses' problem was. He, he was apparently an angry person at times. And so whether he was murdering somebody that made him angry and burying him in the desert, or whether he was disobeying uh, God and hitting the rock twice, or whether he was smashing down the tablets that were given to him, written with the finger of God, whatever, we, we can see some of these things as we look back through. You know, if we are unaware of these blind spots, then we can't protect against it. I know certain people that if I go out to a meal with them, we cannot go anywhere that serves alcohol. Because they know that they can't be anywhere where they serve alcohol. It's not safe for them. They do not trust themselves. Right? I know some people that refuse to have a smartphone. And they, they have something less than a smartphone because they can't trust themselves to have complete access to the internet because of the things that can be found on there. I know people that will avoid certain locations, will have nothing to do with it. I have a friend named Tommy, and you wouldn't know there's anything unusual about Tommy except that he has a little bit of a neck tattoo here that's above his collared shirt and kind of then goes up to underneath his hair. You wouldn't know there's anything weird, but if you had a chance to see him with his arms bare, with his chest bare, with his head shaved, he's covered head to toe in tattoos. Do you know why? Because for years he gave his life to drugs and the devil and the death metal scene. And so some people have no problem listening to certain types of music, but he can't even be around it because of what it reminds him of. There, there are things that if you and I don't learn what they are and then build protections against them and to deal with them in our heart, we're going to end up in ruin. A wise person recognizes their weakness and runs to the Lord. Because when we're weak, then we find our strength. And we have to seek it out prayerfully because, you know why they call it a blind spot? Because you don't see it. Because you don't see it. We must get counsel from people. And once we know what the trouble areas are, we start to work on the heart issue associated with it and to build up defense of it so we don't find ourselves there. Guard your heart. Search out your blind spots. Second of all, let's maintain boundaries with the opposite sex. Solomon lusted, and instead of resisting, he indulged to the fullest. Nothing will destroy a person faster than unrestrained lust, whether that's actually lust-lust or whether it's just a desire after something that God says you should not have this. Nothing will destroy a person faster than failing to maintain boundaries in their heart, recognizing when something gets out of its place. There are many good things that can actually become bad things if they get too big in your life, right? Somebody tell me something that's a good thing, but if it gets too big in your life, it can become a bad thing. Anybody have something like that? A good thing, but if it gets too big, it becomes a bad thing. Will? Work? Is work good, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Working a job is a very good thing, but it can become a bad thing if it becomes your God. Right, Emily? Medicine, right? Yeah, taking the right amount of medicine for the right problems is good, but you take pills for the wrong reason, you'll end up messed up, without a doubt. Kiara? Money. money. Yes. I remember someone telling me when I was younger that money makes a good servant but a terrible master. Makes a good servant, but a terrible master. What's that? Food. Oh, Larry's meddling. He said food. But isn't it the truth? If you've had a rough day, you can either go to Jesus with it, or you can join me up at Dairy Queen. And you can drown your sorrows in a peanut butter cup blizzard. Right? But it's real, isn't it? It absolutely is real. Because you turn for that immediate relief. What else can be good, but if you get too much of it, it can be bad? Lena? The internet. Absolutely. Bill? Sports. Sports. Now we are meddling. There's a game on tonight. Yep. 
Yep. Anybody else? Parker? YouTube. That's right. There's some useful things. You know, you're like, how do I fix my dryer, my clothes dryer? Well, you can get a video on that, but then you can also get in some really bad places with some really bad things. You can really get there in bad things. So we need to make sure that we put boundaries in our life and boundaries in our heart. The boundaries in our heart, we need to make sure we don't indulge these lusts so that they don't grow. Because if we do indulge them, you'll only want more. Just talk to anybody that's been down the, uh, the hallway of substance abuse. At first, they could have a couple of beers when they're partying, no big deal. Then they have to have several. Then they need to have hard liquor. Then they need to have a lot of hard liquor. And they can't just have drinks with friends. They, ha they have to have a, a, a four-day bender where they have no idea what they did or what's going on. Because it starts little and it grows to be big. A, a Japanese proverb says a man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, the drink takes the man. I think it's a pretty accurate proverb. Same thing with drugs. Hey, I just need to chill. I just need to relax a little bit. I just need to smoke something to take the edge off of it. And it begins in that place, and then it becomes, that's not enough to take the edge off. That's not enough hanging out with my friends anymore. I need something a little more. Whether it comes in a needle or in a powder or in a pill, more and more and more until the person is absolutely destroyed by it. You can see how unrestricted lust will get us into all sorts of trouble. By the way, putting boundaries in your life means don't putting yourself in compromising situations. Don't put yourself in compromising situations. The Bible says not to make any provision for the flesh, meaning don't give yourself, don't give yourself some sort of opportunity. It's like this. Let's pick a harmless example, so because we have so many little children. If you're trying to diet, how many bags of Oreos should be in your house? Right? No. No. How many, how many tubs of ice cream should be in your house if you're trying to diet? Right? There, there shouldn't be any. Because probably, if you need to diet, it's because you haven't controlled yourself in the past. Because you have a hard time controlling yourself. And if you got the Oreos in there, you know what happens. It's 1030 in the night. I think I need, I think I need just a little something before I go to bed. And then the whole bag is eaten. Right? I'm, I'm speaking hypothetically. Hypothetically. I've heard this from other people. Specifically on what Solomon dealt with, don't be alone with a member of the opposite sex that's not a part of your family. Just don't put yourself in that situation. Don't text. There's no such thing as harmless flirting. There's no such thing as my office husband, my work husband. That is absolute nonsense. This is a safety measure for you and for them. There's no window shopping, guys. Yes, there is a problem in just looking, because that's how it always starts. I was just looking. No big deal. I was just looking. Ladies, in inviting somebody, a, a man, into your life who is listening to you, and it's so nice to have someone listen to me and care about and ask me questions and spend time talking with them. No, it's not. No, it's not. By the way, you should never speak disparagingly of your spouse to a member of the opposite sex. Never. Ladies, don't run down your husband to the guy at work. Husbands, don't run down your wife to the, to the lady on the job site. Absolutely inappropriate. Absolutely inappropriate. You have no idea where that will lead. You say, ah, it's so legalistic. So many rules. I like to, to think about the silly time when uh, Dr. Lee Robertson was driving around campus and he was, he was on his way home and he saw his wife walking down from the campus to their house, which wasn't too far off campus. He was the, uh, the founder of Tennessee Temple and the, the pastor of the Highland Park Baptist Church. He's written a bunch of great books. Dr. Robertson was a wonderful man. But he had very strict rules, and, and he was not going to be seen stopping and picking up a woman off of the street. So he drove by his wife, and when he got home, he heard it. <laughs> but he was, he was going to maintain that. No... It's not about the rules. It's just I've seen, and you know, too many people who've ruined their lives. I, I've, I've had to deal with things in ministry. Perhaps you've had to deal with things with family or friends. Too many people. And it started out, no big deal. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. The last thing is to guard your heart against idolatry. 
search out your blind spots, maintain boundaries, but also guard your heart against idolatry. Solomon's sin of lust turned him away from God, and it turned him to idols, literal idols, right? Literal statues in the high places, on the hills, where they had altars, where they were burning incense and doing sacrifice. But idolatry is simply worshiping something that is, um, worshiping something as a god, even though it's not god, right? It's taking something and putting it in god's place. We look to it for life, satisfaction, protection, blessing, comfort, all of it. So whatever we love more than God is an idol. And we've already talked about things that are good that can become a problem. Did you know that your family can become an idol? Parents, your children, your grandchildren can become an idol. You say, how do I know if something is an idol? If you were put to choose between that thing and God, or that person and God, and you would choose that person or that thing, they have become an idol. They have become an idol. How does this play out practically? How does this play out practically? Well, when you would normally be doing something either for this, this desire or doing something for God, and you choose for this desire, whether it's work, comfort, pleasure, alcohol, whatever, and you choose this over God, you know that things have gotten out of hand, right? Well, I, I, don't, I don't, it's hard to get up on Sunday morning because I'm out late on Saturday night with my friends and we've got so much that's going on and I, I just don't want to give that up, so I don't normally make it to Sunday morning because of that. Well, if you're choosing something that either is feeding this desire or choosing the Lord, you can tell what it is. If you're like, oh, I, I missed my time to read my Bible and pray again, what were you doing? Well, I was on my phone. I was scrolling. Uh-oh. Personal re repentance here. Personal experience. That's a problem. Something has gotten out of balance. And so we need to make sure that we guard our heart. It can be something evil, or it could be something good. But Solomon's problem was, at the end of the day, in his heart. Solomon's problem was, at the end of the day, in his heart. And that's where our problems will be. And so we need to fill our heart with the Lord Jesus Christ, which crowds out all those other things. See, that's, that's one of the, the things that I learned that was such a big revelation for me. I, for example, I wanted to stop swearing, right? I wanted to stop swearing. And so last month, I talked with Steve. No, I'm just kidding. No, I wanted to stop swearing. I was newly saved. I was gone at Ohio State, and I was trying to figure out how I could clean up because I had a filthy mouth, just a filthy mouth. And so I tried and tried and tried all sorts of things to stop swearing because it would just come out so naturally, right? Well, you know what it took? I was trying to pull that out of my life. You know what I needed to do was crowd it out of my life. The more I made of Jesus, the more I was in my Bible, the more I prayed, the more I listened to godly music, the more I got with God's people in God's house and listened to God's word being preached, the more I served the Lord by serving other people, God got bigger and bigger and bigger, and you know what happened? He crowded it right out of my life. There was no room for it anymore. It kept getting pushed closer and closer and closer to the edge of the table, and eventually it fell off, and it wasn't there anymore. I think that's perhaps one of the greatest uh, things that God has taught me, is that when I want to stop that, I need more of him. Yeah, I can, I can not go to that restaurant, or I can put internet filters on, or, or I can stay away from that person, and, and I can have uh, location tracking on my phone, and I can make sure to do all of these things, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a heart issue. And the heart issue is only going to be solved by God changing our hearts. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and Hittites. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes for a moment? I want to thank you for your good attention. We've come to the time in our service that we call a, a time of invitation where we invite you to act in your own heart and mind on whatever it is that God has spoken to you about. Now, I don't know what he's spoken to you about, but I know what he's spoken to me about. Perhaps, for you, you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior. You really have no idea to put God in his rightful place. You have no problem following after these other things because you don't yet know God. I want you to know that tonight you can be saved. 
Jesus Christ, God's Son, became a man without ceasing to be God, and he lived a sinless life. He revealed God the Father to us, and he died for our sins. He laid his life down. He paid that penalty that we deserve. If you've ever gotten in trouble, you know what it's like to have to pay a penalty. Well, Jesus paid it for us, something we could never pay. And he had to lay down his life. So terrible was sin <clears throat> that the only thing that could cover it was the precious blood of God's Son. And he didn't stay dead, but he was buried and rose from the grave. And if you believe that, and you ask the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and be your Savior in prayer, he has promised that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But tonight, this study in Solomon's life leads me to ask questions more to the believer. Perhaps it's about a blind spot. Maybe you don't know what it is, but your, your life is just tumultuous, and it seems to be a mess, and it's up and it's down, and it's up and it's down. Maybe you feel far from God, and you don't know why you feel far from God. Ask the Spirit of God to show you what the problem is. Ask the Spirit of God to give you wisdom. Seek counsel with godly people that you trust. Maybe you know what the blind spot is. It's not a blind spot anymore. Now it's just a weak spot. Have you put boundaries in your heart against it? Are you staying close to the Lord Jesus? Are you memorizing scripture about that thing? Are you surrounding yourself with people to encourage you? in the right direction? Have you set boundaries in your heart? What about in your life? Practical things, obstacles to put up between you and engaging in whatever that sinful behavior might be, whether it's in your thoughts or in your words or in your actions. Have you put up boundaries, things that would get in your way if you tried to do it? Hopefully they'd get in your way long enough for the Spirit of God to convict you so that you don't actually engage in it. We need to set boundaries. Guard our hearts. Finally, guarding our hearts against idolatry. Has something in your life gotten out of its rightful place? Has it become too big? Has someone become too big? Has pleasing someone or proving someone wrong or holding someone's feet to the fire in bitterness and unforgiveness? Is, is, is lust something that you've let run wild and not repented of it? Is it work? Is it your children? This sounds really weird, but even service to God can become a problem when we get too busy doing stuff for God that we have no time to spend with God. Maybe something has creeped its way, and you say, Lord, help me to get it out. Help me to get it out. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, I just want to pray for you. If that's you, you say something has gotten out of its rightful place, and Lord helping me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get close to Jesus and crowd it out. You say, that's me. Something has gotten out of place. Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? You say, something's gotten out of place. Uh, it's, it's something that ought not be there. Lord, help me. Thank you very much. You can put your hands down. Maybe God has spoken to you about, we need to set up some boundaries about something. Something that you know is a weakness for you, and you're making provision to the flesh right now. You're, you're leaving yourself open. And you say, Lord, helping me, we're going to patch that gap. We're going to mend that fence. We're going to put up some obstacles. Say, Lord, Lord, help me to set the right boundaries in my heart and in my life. Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Lord, help me. I'm, I'm putting something there to keep me from doing it. Amen. Amen. Perhaps God has spoken to you about something completely different. I want to let you know you'll never regret saying yes to God. You'll never regret following the Lord. In just a moment, we're going to sing, stand. I want to invite you, if you raised your hand, if God has been speaking to you about any of these things or things that are not been addressed tonight. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you want to come and you want to pray and ask the Lord for help. This altar is open as a place of prayer. If you're unable to make it, you can pray right there in your seat. If you need to be saved or follow the Lord in baptism or put your life and influence in this church as a member, I'll be down here in front. Just slip out of your seat and let me know. Father, I do pray that you take this time of invitation. And as we have been invited by your spirit, may we say yes to you. Be glorified in our obedience, Father. Help us to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. My Jesus, I love Don't delay. If God has spoken to you, do business with him.
Father in heaven, thank you for your great mercy. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the power to live the Christian life that we find in you and in you alone. Help us to have victory, to take steps in the right direction. Take your rightful place in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Well, it's finally here. Our mission conference, World Mission Conference, begins this week. This Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, 7 p.m., we're going to meet here. We have a number of missionaries coming in to be with us, missionaries to Uganda, Japan, Sierra Leone, Bible printing and gospel distribution, uh, First Bible, India, Nehemiah's Network, Haiti. We have all sorts of new friends and some uh, old uh, favorites, like the, the Harrigans. They've been coming here. I don't know how long Paul and Luke have been coming here, but it's always wonderful to see them. Uh, and Saturday, we'll be meeting at 5 o'clock. We have a service project. We're putting some things together to give out that have uh, the gospel in them and some practical things to when you're driving around town and you see someone standing on the street side with a sign, homeless folks. Great opportunity to give the gospel and to show the love of Christ. There'll be other things going on that night. And then Sunday morning and Sunday evening, same times, but we'll have missionary speakers presenting and preaching, things for the kids. It's going to be a fantastic time. So do all you can to be with us. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 7 p.m., Saturday, 5 p.m., there'll be a service following the, the project, and then we'll also meet on Sunday at normal times. If you have not yet gotten a packet of all of our supported missionaries, I want to encourage you to do so so you can pray for them. We passed this out a couple weeks ago, but there's a few of them still on the Lord's Supper table. And so if we run out, we'll print out more. But it also has the names of our missionary guests and pictures of their families inside. And so you can be praying for them as you get ready to come to the church service. You know how you can get the most out of a church service? is to be ready to receive. It's to be ready. Don't come in saying, bless me if you dare, but have a prayerful heart. Have be thinking about it. Be praying for these missionaries. And so we have the Kareckis, the Browns, uh, La the LaBelles, the Robinsons. Uh, we have Luke and Paul Harrigan with us, the Johnsons, Pastor and Mrs. Jenkins. Should be an absolutely wonderful time. And so do what you can to be here with us. We also, this morning, handed out our Faith Promise Commitment Cards. This is for those of you that want to intentionally support missions work financially, uh, and you want to make a decision between you and God saying, Lord, helping me, I want to give so much money to missions, either a week or a month or perhaps annually in one gift. But this is not for you to write your name on. There is a place for you to turn this in, and we'll be asking people to do that later on. But we don't want your name. We're not going to chase you down. This is something that you should prayerfully talk about between you and the Lord. And if you can, and you, you've not given, start giving. If you do give, pray about increasing that. We found many different ways, including selling uh, Brother Steve's golf clubs, where we can find $5. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's what we talked about in the morning service. Poor Pastor Steve. He's sick and at home and can't even defend himself. Poor guy. 
But this is for you, the small parts, for you to keep, to put somewhere to remind yourself of what God put in your heart to do and so that you're faithful to do it. And uh, this part you can turn in, and this is uh, not the only thing that helps us decide how many missionaries we'll take on, but it is a helpful thing to give us an idea of what the Lord might be doing in the hearts of our people. So if you haven't gotten one of these, there's some on the Lord's Supper table. Some of you may have been out serving this morning. Make sure you grab one. Even the little kids can make a promise to the Lord in order to give, and you'll see God provide in amazing ways. Would you join me in praying for Pat Nowak's family? They're mourning the loss of Pat's mother. She's had just such a hard battle of it over the last several months, and the family's been doing all they can to take care of her, and, and she finally was called home. And so pray for Pat. It's great in the sense that they got a chance to be with her for about the last week or so down in West Virginia. So we praise God for that. But it's, it, even though you expect it, it's never easy. It's never easy. So lift them up in prayer. Pray for Pat, her siblings, all of the children, grandchildren of that family. Pray for Bob. Ask the Lord to bless and to help them. Um, I'm missing someone else. Pray for Mike Wagner. He's got a terrible, that UTI just doesn't seem to stay gone. It's been such a hard, hardship for him. Ask the Lord to lift him up and to help him uh, and to bless him. Jim, who am I forgetting? Doug Babbitt. Doug Babbitt. Uh, good news, positive movement, right, in the right direction. And so we're praising God for that in the Vargas as well. Remember to pray for, for uh, them as we see progress heading in the right direction. All right. Let's stand for a close. Oh, Emily, did you have your hand up? All right, we'll, we'll pray about that later. All right, Gabby, did you have a prayer request? Oh, my. So Greg's brother has double pneumonia and emphysema? Good. And you said his name was Randy? We'll definitely pray for him. Without a doubt, that sounds very serious. Let's pray for them. Let's stand together and we'll close out in prayer. Thank you so much again for being in the Lord's house. May he bless you as you go tonight. Let's pray for a few of these things before we, we head out. Brother Brett Deeks, would you pray for a couple of these things and close out our service?